boys have been test driving cars all year long. It's about time they made a decision. That's this week on Motoring 2002. TSN's Motoring 2002 is brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas! It's that time of the year again when Motoring presents the best in class in our overall car of the year for 2002. Hello everybody and once again this week we're at the Docks Entertainment Center in downtown Toronto. Just outside is that massive parking lot where Graham Fletcher stages the pylon and braking segments each week on Test Drive. Now, Graham will be joining me in just a moment, but first I'd like to introduce you to a couple of guests you saw off the top of the program, and that is Lisa and Rosanna. And their job this week will be to unveil our car of the year. But joining me now, as promised, our man behind the wheel, Graham Fletcher. And Graham, what are we going to see over the next half hour? I promise you, Brad, an automotive extravaganza covering everything from economy cars to pickup trucks and everything in between. Now, as in previous years, each category will have a winner, and from that group, we will pick our overall car of the year. But you know, the real story this year has been one of horsepower. Where 175 was once considered V8-like, it's now offered in a four-cylinder engine, and you've got to love that. Now, without further ado, let's check out our first two categories, economy car and family car. At last, the Sentra has come of age. It now has some semblance of style and certainly a lot more refinement, a healthy turn of speed and plenty of interior room. As such, it should figure well up on any shopping list. The Spectre is classy to the eye, comfortable and handles well. As such, it's the best Kia car to date. However, to be a real player, the lazy automatic and complete lack of anti-lock brakes must be addressed. Mazda's fortunes have been somewhat iffy of late. However, in the Protégé 5, it has a home run. The best of a hatchback wagon and sports car are blended into an attractive and nimble package. Based upon its merits and significance to the market, it easily wins our best new entry-level car. Once dowdy and underpowered, the new Altima sets high standards regardless of price. For the frugal at heart, the 175 horse four-banger is a delight. Those into adrenaline surges to take the 240 horse V6. Look out world, Nissan really does mean business with this car. The Toyota Camry was not broken before the rework, but that's not to say the new car isn't better in every respect. More show, more go, and all for less dough. Factor in a comfortable ride and plenty of room, and well, you have a hot contender. The Passat debuts with a revamped look and a stronger 180 horse engine. Slipped behind the wheel and the rather bleak interior of old has been traded in for a swanky new look and feel. It is indeed a very distant relative to the original people's car. Our best new family car goes to the Nissan Altima. My father was a criminal lawyer, and no, that's not a redundancy. So I grew up understanding that no matter how heinous the crime, the alleged perpetrator deserves a fair and complete defense. I also understand that there are strict procedures in place in our courts, primarily so the government doesn't run roughshod over the civil rights of its citizens. Still, it bugs me when I see guys charged with drunk driving, the number one criminal cause of death in this country, getting off on technicalities. And isn't it beyond ironic that the people defending these guys are usually not lawyers, but former police officers. Aren't these the guys that used to be scraping their victims off the pavement? Well, it might be legal, but it certainly isn't justice. I'm Jim Kenzie. Ever wondered why mechanics make their sandwiches out of dark rye bread? No matter how much you scrub these fingers at lunchtime, you never get them perfectly clean. I did a rad job this morning in that gooey black paint from the rad. It takes days for that stuff to come off, no matter how many times you wash. Brad wanted me all cleaned up, squeaky clean for this car of the year show. Wanted me to wear a tux too. I didn't even own a tux, Brad. 
This is as close as it gets, buddy. You want a choir boy or a mechanic? Find somebody who knows about cars and take them with you. <laughs> you know, there's so much out there. Know what you, what it is you want, because if you go in not knowing what it is you're looking for, you're just going to end up confused. Don't fall in love with a car when you go into to a dealership, or at least don't let them know you have. We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto and standing by are Lisa and Rosanna who will soon be unveiling our car of the year for the year 2002. But first, let's join Graham. With the leading edge of the boomer generation hitting about 54 years of age, the market dynamic is shifting in Canada. Where these were the people that once embraced SUVs and pickup trucks, they've now got their sights set on leather-lined opulence. And so this year, we've got three categories that look at the finer things of life. Entry-level luxury, prestige cars, and of course, money no object, upper luxury. The Acura TL Type S is a welcome addition to a lineup loaded with all stars. While similar to the base car, the Type S is more suited to a Type A personality. With 260 horses under the hood, it is a modern day Pegasus as this car really flies. As with the Camry, the rework of the ES300 is a thing of beauty. It is clean and classy to the look, loaded with comfort and convenience. Too bad the engine didn't receive the same treatment as the rest of the car. In the past, Infiniti's middle model struggled to stand out from the crowd. The latest version and its 255 horse engine not only stands out, it leaves most of them well behind. Likewise, slipping behind the wheel reveals a luxurious leather-lined interior. Motoring's luxury car of the year is the Infiniti i35. BMW's 3 Series has long been revered for its ability and agility. Sliding a decent all-wheel drive system under an already nimble chassis adds enormously to the potential. Simply, it adds a sure-footed work ethic to a sporty persona. Volvo's new all-wheel drive S60 builds on last year's winner. The new Haldex all-wheel drive system adds to the balance, shuttling the power around as and when needed. The design really does speak highly of Volvo's reputation for safety. Jaguar lived with but two arrows in its quiver. Then came the S-Type, which double sails. The X-Type is likely to exceed that, bringing a refined interior, decent engine, and a very capable all-wheel drive system. In short, it's more than worthy of wearing the Leaper on the hood, and so wins our prestige car of the year. Loaded to the grill with luxury, the reworked LS430 brings a much better motivator in the form of a larger 4.3-litre engine. For those lucky enough to go for a ride, the comfort coddles and the refinement, but it overwhelms. Once more famous for its outrageous badge and powerful engine, the new Q45 brings more of everything. More luxury, more power and much better refinement. It also boasts the world's best set of headlights. Easily the best of the bunch when it comes to out-and-out -out performance and handling, the M3 is a true delight to drive. However, the tight rear seating and small trunk conspire to place it a whisker behind the winner of this year's upper luxury sedan, the Lexus LS430. The end of the season isn't only a time for celebration, it's also a time of remembrance. I'm not talking only about September 11th, because in the first NASCAR race of 2001 at Daytona, we lost one of the greats of car racing, Dale Earnhardt. Ironically, he died defending the winning position of his son, who said Dale never had a heart. Now, I got some flack from some so-called sophisticated people in big city Toronto for driving around in the Dale Earnhardt Designer Edition Monte Carlo. But you take this little puppy out to the small towns or the country where the real people live, they know who the real heroes are. Dale, we're going to miss you. I'm Jim Kenzie. Our Midas Tip of the Week concerns the use of winter tires. If your front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive vehicle has skinny all-season tires, you can have pretty good performance in the snow. But when you get heavy, wet packing snow like we had yesterday, even those vehicles can have a hard time without four winter tires. And believe me, four winter tires is the route to go if your vehicle has large tires, high performance tires, or you want to have that extra margin of safety in the snow, 
four winter tires is well worth it. And just like any other set of tires, if you look after them, they'll give you good performance for many seasons. If you buy a good set of winter tires, make sure you keep them properly inflated, rotate them from one season to the next to even up the wear, and keep your vehicle in proper wheel alignment, and you'll get good life out of that set of tires. And if they save you one collision with a curb or another vehicle during that lifespan of the set of tires, they will have more than paid for themselves. That's your Midas tip of the week. The newest member of the C-Class range blends a sporting acumen with the advantages of a hatchback design. It's also affordable, attractive and boasts one of the more innovative sunroofs offered. With 160 horsepower and a very balanced set of road manners, the Acura RSX is a worthy successor to the Integra. The bottom line says this is a real driver's car, ladding fast corners and quick in a straight line. Subaru's WRX is the class of the sports car brigade. Laying 220 horsepower to the tarmac through a sophisticated all-wheel drive system brings a car that goes like the clappers and handles like the dickens. In short, our best new sports car. Powerful panache is the best description of the SC430. It brings a sultry look, an abundant supply of power and a hard top convertible. It will take you through winter in as much comfort as it rides out the summer months. Once the 120 pound weakling, the Mercedes-Benz SLK32 is now the car that's doing the kicking. 349 horsepower and something barely bigger than an overgrown roller skate equates to a ride of a lifetime. With retro becoming a bigger part of the automotive landscape, the latest Thunderbird is a thing of beauty. Power, comfort, a tight chassis and a look that will be mistaken for nothing else on the road leads the Bird's long list of desirable traits. However, our best new convertible goes to the Mercedes-Benz SLK32. Now to the scoreboard for a rundown on the 1992. I forgot what the car was. This new three-litre sequentially multi-port fueling. <laughs> Sorry. Which of our nominees will be crowned Car of the Year for 2002? We'll find out soon, so stay with us as Motoring's Car of the Year special continues. Under that cover is Motoring's Car of the Year for 2002, and in just a short time, Lisa and Rosanna will pull the wraps off our new champion. But now let's join Graham for our next nominees. Our next three categories all deal with versatility. First up, we've got Best New Station Wagon, followed by the fastest growing segment in Canada, and that's Compact SUV. Lastly, we have Intermediate Sports Utility Vehicle. The Passat Wagon is, at last, a class act. As well as combining versatility with a sporty package, it brings a decent interior, one that's far more inviting than before. As with its sedan sibling, the WRX Wagon blends copious amounts of go with a decent interior and the versatility of a small wagon. For several years, Mercedes craved a wagon. It has arrived and was worth the wait. The 3.2-litre engine is smooth, the interior comfortable, and the cargo space voluminous. With utility being a big part of the wagon's appeal, the Mercedes-Benz 320 wagon edges out the WRX by the closest of margins. With the previous CRV, Honda heard a couple of things repeatedly. It lacked power and could do with more room. The latest version addresses both, upping the power and adding to the interior size. It also brings a soft ride and a smart new dash. The Liberty is the replacement for the Cherokee, and so gone is the basic box, and in its place, an attractive design that speaks of Jeep. The same applies to its unstoppable off-road ethic, which includes a low-range gear set. The biggest Suzuki to date, the XL7, brings room and seating for seven, which is something of a rarity at this end of the market. It also benefits from a larger 2.7 litre 6, a low range gear set, and decidedly decent road manners. Given that fewer than 10% of these vehicles ever go off road, we will stick with the softer side and award the Honda CRV our compact ute of the year. After the problems at the back end of the previous model, the new Explorer had to be better in every respect. This one is bringing more room, better refinement and an independent rear suspension. Big and capable of taking you anywhere you want to go sums up the Toyota Sequoia. With generous power, comfort and a luxurious interior, it's only let down by its price. 
GM's mid-sized SUVs have always lacked. Enter the Trailblazer, Bravada and Envoy. With the best six offered in a truck, a compliant ride and plenty of room, this trio has a winning work ethic, picking up our best new intermediate SUV of the year. This week we're going to do the switcheroo on you. Bill Gardner's going to do the rant, and I'm going to give you some tips. All right, here are my tips. Don't tug on Superman's cape. Don't spit in the wind. Don't pull the mask off that old Lone Ranger. And when it comes to looking after your car, don't mess around with Bill. You know, Jim, there's never a day goes by that somebody doesn't recognize me from the show and want to talk cars or trucks, motorcycles, boats, whatever their machinery is. And you know how many times somebody describes to me a piece of machinery that I happen to know very well, and they're telling me they had a lot of trouble with it, just wasn't a very good piece of equipment. And it's all I can do to bite down on my tongue and not give them heck for abusing it or neglecting it because that's usually the reason why they've had so much trouble with it. Perfect example, how many times have you given somebody a ride in your vehicle, had them get out of the vehicle and slam the door with a vengeance? Just makes, your, makes you cringe to feel the abuse they give the car when a simple push will close the door. And that's indicative of how rough they treat all their equipment. Then they wonder why it doesn't stand up. On the other side of the coin, how many times have you talked to somebody that's got a kind of marginal or cheap car and said they had great service out of it? Reason they had great service out of it? They didn't use it abusively and they looked after it. Even junk can give you good service. I want to give you a perfect example. This is my loaner car from the shop. And when it comes back, I can't believe how many times the right front tire is all crunched into the curb and the wheel disc is being crunched. The other day I saw concrete dust on it, some new scrape marks on it. Somebody would run it into the curb real hard. We put the best of tires on it, new front end parts and do the alignment. And this is how people treat it. And they treat their own cars the same way. Rough, rough, rough treatment. And this catches up to you after a while and it costs you money. Now under the hood of the car, it's incredible how many times we have a a vehicle come in that's, that the oil is right down off the dipstick and maybe been 10 or 12,000 kilometers since it was last changed. It's filthy dirty. It's got cheap filters in it and other cheap replacement parts under the hood. And people are wondering why the car doesn't last them. There's no excuse for the engine oil to be low on, on a modern car. There's no reason why you can't check it and top it up easily, get it changed when you need to, and keep records on when you do all this stuff so you stay on top of it because it's too easy to forget the last time you serviced your car and just let it go. If you keep records, you'll have no problem. I'll tell you, whatever car you're driving is your car of the year, and if you look after it, you're going to get good service out of it nine times out of ten. Till next week, I'm Bill Gardner for Motoring 2002. The latest Ram is one big truck. While you don't need a step ladder to get in, when fully duded up, you almost sit eyeball to eyeball with the driver behind the wheel of that tractor trailer. The Swiss Army knife was never purchased for its looks, nor will the Avalanche. Looking more like an overgrown Tonka toy, the flexibility is undeniable and opens up a new chapter in the evolution of the pickup truck. As such, it wins our pickup of the year. Kia's turnaround is more spectacular than that of its parent company, Hyundai. Sedona marries all the items needed in a minivan, bringing a powerful engine and seating for seven, along with a price that's thousands less than the competition. While the changes to the O2 Odyssey are minimal, it's enough to make it a better vehicle. Honda's legendary refinement is there for all to see, the drivetrain is sweet, and that fold-away seat still ranks as one of the better ideas on the market. While not a true minivan, the Rendezvous will accommodate seven in comfort. It also brings some neat interior amenities and just enough power. Sadly though, it's just too difficult to get beyond the look, and so the minivan of the year goes to the Kia Sedona. For years, I've been looking for a hand signal that we as drivers can use to ask forgiveness of other drivers when we've made a mistake. I mean, there's no shortage of hand signals that we use when they make a mistake. Well, I think I've found it. I was on the highway the other day, and a gentleman who was obviously in the process of missing his exit was doing about a four-lane Banzai lane change. He didn't exactly cut me off, but it was fairly close, and he saw me at the last minute and wrenched his car back in his lane and obviously looked pretty worried. I just slowed down, waved him in front of me, and as he made eye contact, he whacked himself in the head, sort of to apologize. That was pretty funny. So I smiled, he smiled, he whacked himself again, and we all carried on our way. And I thought, you know, Everybody should do that. Next time you make a mistake, you do something stupid on the road, 
Don't just drive along like as if nothing happened. Don't get mad at the other guy like it was his fault. Do what he'd do if he had half a chance. Give yourself a whack upside the head. He'll probably forgive you too. I'm Jim Kenzie. When we return, the moment we have all waited for, when Lisa and Rosanna will unveil our Car of the Year for 2002. Stay with us as our Car of the Year special continues on TSN. I would uh, like to see people look at the fuel consumption, the price of car, and you know, buy the car you need, not only the, not the, the car you want or you dream about, just the car you need, and you will save a lot of money. You can spend uh, on other other things, more important things, perhaps. We're back at the Docks Entertainment Center in Toronto, where in just a few minutes, Lisa and Rosanna will unveil our Car of the Year for 2002. But first, let's join Jim Kent. Now, I probably say the same thing every year, but for me, a Car of the Year has to be something really special. It can't just be the best selling or the best value or the safest. It's got to really move the goalposts in terms of design and engineering. Now, often, car makers don't want to do something radical in a big volume segment, so Cars of the Year are often specialty cars. But this year, we've got a car that is radical looking, fabulous handling, great performance, tremendous value, and it's in a big volume segment. Now, this choice is so obvious that, well, it, it wasn't obvious enough for Motor Trend to get it right, but what do you expect? But it's so obvious, I think even Brad and Graham can't get this one wrong. The 2002 Car of the Year, no question, the Nissan Altima. You know, Jim, this year's Car of the Year was the closest race to date, requiring a photo finish to pick the winner. On the one hand, you've got the Mazda Protégé 5. It truly is a wonderful little car and certainly a harbinger of things to come. However, it was pipped at the post. I now ask Lisa and Rosanna to reveal Motoring 2002's Car of the Year. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the Nissan Altima. The new Nissan Altima has significance to both manufacturer and market alike. Indeed, without this year's Car of the Year, the fortunes of Nissan, well, they might look rather bleak. Well, we're out of time, but already we're planning next year's Car of the Year program, and we'd like to involve you, our viewers, and have you make your Car of the Year selections via our webpage. We'll tell you more about that as the year continues. And speaking of years, this is our 16th season on TSN. Thank you for that. That's it for now. We'll see you next time out as we continue to bring you more stories about cars and the people who drive them. TSN's Motoring 2002 has been brought to you by Quaker State Motor Oils, formulated for the vehicles you drive and the way you drive them. And Midas, keep a good thing going. Go Midas.